Hello everybody and welcome to this Smart Recovery webinar. My name is Jenny Valentish and I'm a journalist here in Australia and I'm on the board of Smart Recovery Australia. So I'm here on Zoom with Dr. Joe Gerstein, he's the founding president of Smart Recovery. And Smart Recovery is a self-empowering program that, that supports life beyond addiction. For the past 30 years, Joe has also been a Smart Recovery facilitator, which means he's been guiding one of the free meetings, including one tonight in Miami, just before he's come to us here. So that's commitment for you. Um, I personally discovered one of those Smart Recovery meetings in Australia back in 2009, when I wanted to tackle my drug and alcohol use. And I went on to extol its virtues in a book that I wrote about women and addiction called Women of Substances. But for me, there was great appeal in the self-management aspects and the idea that you could learn more and more um, tools that you could apply to your life as you attend meetings. So in this webinar, Joe's going to take us all the way back uh, to the inception of Smart Recovery, which was officially in 1994, although as he'll explain, its roots are even further back. Um, and he'll talk about the enthusiasm with which Australia leapt onto Smart. And uh, we'll talk a bit about how SMART has risen to the challenges of the pandemic in 2020. We've got a lot to get through, but you should be able to see a Q&A box. Um, so you can write questions in there as we go. And if we haven't already covered them, we'll see what we can cover in about five or 10 minutes at the end of this uh, webinar. So, Joe, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, happy to be here. Great. <laughs> I don't know where here is exactly, but <laughs> I know, be be wherever, wherever I am, yes. <laughs> so you got, you got on board with Smart Recovery back when it was still rational recovery and you were a doctor specialising in pain management and you, you discovered it and you thought quite early on, this is going to change the world. But can you tell us um, how, you, how you came to discover Smart in the first place and came on board? Yes, well, as a physician, I was a, also an internal medicine physician, uh, academic physician, and uh, 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 in my general practice of medicine, I ran into a number of people with addictions, mainly alcohol, but also uh, opioids in those days, those days being late 80s, let's say. Uh, my training in addictions was modest. I went to medical school in the 1950s, and I had all of two hours of lectures on addiction. And they went too helpful. Actually, in those days, they thought uh, cocaine was not addicting. So um, I uh, had a number of patients. I used to try to send them to AA or NA. Some, almost all would go and try it, but some didn't like it for one reason or another. Some objected to the religiosity. Some objected to the, the style. Some objected to the idea of powerlessness. I used to argue with them and uh, uh, had a whole roster of excuses to put forward or uh, manipulations to get them to go. But some just wouldn't go, and that was it. And they were just orbiting around. And uh, there was almost no other structure uh, except for the 12 steps for people who had addictions at that time. Uh, and uh, I, I remember particularly I ran into one man who was a diabetic and I met him on the emergency unit and he had an infection in his toe. And uh, he, uh, uh, I took him on as a patient and because of the infection, I had to see him every day. So I saw him the next day in my office we started him on oral antibiotics and we look at the progress and if it's progressing, we continue them on oral antibiotics. And if not, we have to bring them into the hospital, put them on intravenous antibiotics. But on my way to see him, it was just a squeeze in appointment, five minutes. His wife accosted me in the hall and uh, uh, said, doctor, uh, you should know my husband is an alcoholic and things have gotten so bad that I gave a retainer to a lawyer and I'm going to divorce him. Um, and I'm, I'm a devout Catholic, so you'll know that that's a major issue. Well, I, I knew then my morning was ruined. But I went into the room, I took care of his foot, was improving, and then I had a discussion with him and uh, uh, he told me that he had been had two warnings at work 
And if he got another warning, that would be it, he'd be fired. So he agreed to go to an AA meeting and uh, cutting the whole thing short, he tried three different meetings for one reason or another, he didn't like them and refused to go back, refused to see a psychiatrist. Uh, and uh, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, and uh, I called a, a family a family therapist I knew, and he said, well, send him to a DUI meeting, driving under the influence. I said, well, he, he hasn't had any DUI, he didn't have any problems like that. I said, well, that's it, that's all that's left. So I sent him and he got better. Uh, he said, I just want the facts. Just give me the facts. So that was in the back of my head when I heard Jack Trimpey talk about his new program of rational recovery, which was a science based based on cognitive behavioral principles. And uh, I decided I wanted to bring this program to Boston and uh, make it available. And uh, it took me about a year to get a small grant to get Jack to come to Boston. I got absolutely no support from the treatment, addiction treatment community, what there was of it. And uh, uh, we got one meeting started. There was a, I had him give a talk at Harvard. There were about 90 people there. And we had a meeting of about 100 people the next evening uh, in a Harvard, uh, uh, a Harvard building. And then but we only got one group going out of that. And after, after about four or five meetings, they began to argue with the facilitator. There was no formal training program or anything at that time. Anyway, uh, I had to go and take over the meeting or see the whole thing go up in smoke. And I really didn't know what I was doing. They insisted that I come back. I saw right away that uh, this program was having rather profound effects on people. And that's where I got the idea that it was going to change the world. <laughs> so I joined up. And uh, that was over 3,000 meetings ago, 800 of them in prison. So it is around the world now. It's in 28 countries and uh, about 300 prisons run our inside out prison program. So uh, that's it. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I actually lived long enough to see the goal accomplished. We now have a separate, we now have a separate Smart Recovery International Organization. That's right, yeah, and with a sort of global website to feed into all the different member countries that we have. Um, so can you just describe briefly um, how Smart then rose out of rational recovery? So who, who were the earliest people who, who were on board with Smart Recovery? Well, by the time I got involved, there were, um, there were people who were doing it, mainly mental health professionals, mainly those who had been trained by Albert Ellis in, in a cognitive technique called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, REBT. And uh, um, they had, of course, rediscovered the concepts of ancient Greeks and ancient Romans about how uh, how our emotions tend to control our decisions and how we can con control our emotions by changing the way we think about things. So they rediscovered it. It wasn't like they discovered it, but they put it, they put it into a scientific format and so that it was accessible to people. <clears throat> and there had been studies at Yale showing that cognitive behavioral therapy worked in in addictions, in, um, in helping people get over addictions. But then when the funds of the grant ran out, that was it. There was no way except going to a private therapist to get continuing um, uh, uh, access to CBT or REBT treatment. Well, anyway, these, uh, uh, the first board that convened for rational recovery was nine professionals and two peers, people who had been successful with the program. Now in the 30 years or so since that time in 1990, uh, things have changed. The board now has 11 people and the nine of them are peers, people who have been successful with the Smart Recovery Program and want to give back. And maybe I think one is, uh, was uh, 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 involved in family and friends, Smart Family and Friends meetings. Uh, her 
partner was the person with the addiction. Uh, the other eight have uh, personally benefited from smart recovery. Um, I'm quite interested in the earlier formats of the meetings and the trial and error that must have gone on. And also to tack on to that, at what point did the program extend to be all sorts of addictive behaviours? You know, not just alcohol or drugs, but smoking, gambling, sex, what have you. All right. Well, really, from the beginning, we didn't make any, any distinctions. Um, uh, I always used what I call the Gertrude Stein uh, approach to addictions. An addiction is an addiction is an addiction. So whether it's internet or gambling or heroin or whatever, the fundamental brain mechanisms are the same. There are, of course, nuances. There are, of course, uh, medication treatments now for various segments. Uh, mainly alcohol and, and opioids. There doesn't seem to be any useful medications for the other approaches, the other types of addictions. But so that was always our uh, philosophy, although the main streams at, those, at that time was opioids and, uh, and uh, uh, alcohol. And uh, we, uh, we always were congenial to the appropriate use of medications for help in the recovery process. Whether for the primary addiction, they were only, uh, there was only one, <laughs> uh, one at, at the time when we started, that was uh, ant abuse for alcohol. Uh, and of course, very shortly, a methadone maintenance treatment came in, I think in 1991 or 1992. But that was it for about 20 years until some more approaches came on the market. Um, so that, that's always been the song that we sang and uh, uh, meetings have, uh, have generally had a spectrum of uh, people. Sometimes I've had maybe six people at a meeting, six different addictions. And um, while um, Smart Recovery used to be described as abstinence-based, it's now described as abstinence orientated. Um, now that reminds me of uh, a story you told me at a very early meeting you were facilitated. You asked everyone there, I think it was 12 people, whether they actually wanted to stop drinking. Uh, and that turned out to be quite an enlightening meeting for you. Can you tell me about that? Yes. So uh, I was surprised when I began uh, facilitating that um, I learned about the stages of change and realized that some people might be at the meeting who didn't want to re necessarily recover. Uh, I remember a, a meeting at which I took a poll. Uh, I said, uh, whatever your uh, addiction, and they happened to be all the people at that meeting happened to be, uh, alcohol happened to be the problem. And uh, <clears throat> I said, I want you to answer uh, yes or no, do you want to stop using uh, alcohol? And the eight people said yes, four people said no. So this was kind of a, 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 a stun, stunned me because I figured if you came to a recovery meeting, you wanted to recover, which meant stopping the addictive substance. So that was a good lesson for me. And uh, I uh, subsequently began to ask new people on a scale of zero to 10, how strong is your motivation to permanently stop the substance or behavior that you're doing? And uh, the average runs about seven and a half, which is good in a way because people are being honest, obviously. They're not, everybody doesn't say 10. <laughs> so, so people come tentatively. They're not sure, they're ambivalent. I sometimes ask them, do you, is your motivation less, let's say somebody has had horrendous problems. Their wife's threatening to leave them, they, uh, they lost their job, they had a DUI, whatever, and there's still eight on the motivation scale. So I might say, well, uh, why, why are you only eight with everything that's happened to you? Is it because you're not sure you do want to stop or because you're afraid you can't stop? And it's about half and half. About half the people say, well, 
uh, I don't think I can do it. I've tried, I can't do it, it's too hard, whatever. And the other half, I'd say, well, I'm still not sure, I'm ambivalent about it, and so forth. So that gives you a clue as to how to progress in a way in, at the meeting. As you know, because we use motivational interviewing, that's certainly the most important development in the last 30 years in addiction treatment. Um, uh, because we use it, we don't tell people what to do. They, they, we allow them to develop their own goals. Many people move along the spectrum to attend and, and stop, and stop permanently, and maybe become a facilitator, because uh, we now have a terrific online training program, unlike in those days, where the training was coming to a smart recovery meeting for, for six months. So, uh, uh the uh that's well that's it essentially yeah and and smart recovery the program evolves with science it's, it's evidence-based research so as we learn more over the decades you know that becomes uh, adapted in um but does it also have to sort of um align and be flexible depending on which country it's in so for instance in australia we've got a national drug strategy of harm minimization so is there that flexibility? Yeah, I, I, I might add that um, uh, we learn from science as it progresses, but also from running meetings because you, you know, it's impossible to run a hundred meetings and not learn and get insights and get nuances and styles and, and different concepts. Uh, you know, maybe not something you're going to publish in a journal, but a technique or a, a gimmick or a, or a tool. Uh, for instance, I've developed two tools, which we now use regularly. I, I learn from, from people coming to the meeting, listening to them, interacting with them, and finally figuring out a new way to uh, deal and engage them or deal with their issues and so forth. So, so there's been an experience. It, uh, uh, rational recovery was only a two-point program. Now we have a comprehensive four-point program. Uh, the first thing that we were lacking was a mo motivational tools. That's the most important thing. People sometimes ask me in an intro, well, what's the most important thing about recovery? How, if you want to recover. I said, well, number one, motivation. Number two, motivation. Number three, motivation. We know that because uh, many people get over serious addictions without going, without any contact with the recovery system. They just stop. Maybe it was their third time they tried or their fifth time or the 25th time, but they figure out their motivation finally gets high enough. They say, that's it, I'm, I'm through, and they, and they stop. And, and there's very good studies on that. So it's pretty much accepted in the academic community that a lot of people overcome serious addictions on their own. So I tell people that when they come first to a smart recovery meeting, I say, you know, you may be wondering why I'm telling you that people do it without smart recovery. I said, the reason is I want you to understand that it's doable. That's the most important thing. If you come to a meeting and you say, I haven't been able to do this, so it's impossible. That's that's the biggest impediment probably to getting over an addiction is realizing that because you failed, it's impossible. Well, that's incorrect. Uh, most people fail a few times before they finally make it. And some, um, I, I was in prison, running a prison meeting and I met a man there, been to 36 detoxes. And I said, oh my God, how, how can you still be alive after you have to go in for 36 detoxes? And I figured I never was going to see anybody to exceed that. Then at a meeting, I ran into somebody who had been at 52 detoxes. And then he came to smart recovery and he stopped drinking. Then I met someone via smart recovery who had 87 detoxes in, in a veteran, a veteran with PTSD in Veterans Hospital. And then he came to smart recovery. He stopped drinking. He's a, running a facility. Facilitator runs two meetings in Champaign, Illinois now. So, uh, it, you know, if you can live, I mean, one of the problems is it, it's tough to get to 87 meetings and still be alive, 87 detoxes. You were talking about learning from meetings and you said that you'd developed two tools. What were they? 
Well, the first one was I, I realized that people were cheating on the cost benefit analysis. That was our first motivational tool. And it's a very effective motivational tool. But they were equating the immediate gratification that they get, the buzz, the social, the social uh, tranquility, the, uh, the, the getting to sleep easier, all those things with DUIs, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, breakup of relationship, losing all their money. Uh, and they were kind of balancing like six of one, half a dozen of the other. And I said, no, that's crazy. The, the, the uh, most of the negatives are long-term. They impact your life severely. I mean, a broken relationship can be a, a lifelong uh, uh, disaster. Run out of money, uh, fall down the stairs and break your arm. Um, so uh, get a DUI, it now follows you your whole life. When I started doing this in 1990, <clears throat> each, each state in the United States has its own system. And uh, so in Massachusetts, if you had a DUI, you may call it dry, drunk driving or whatever, uh, but it's different nomenclature. But um, uh, if you were arrested for driving under the influence, um, uh, you, and you went six years without another conviction, they wiped the conviction. Now, I guess it was on a sheet of paper somewhere in the basement of the courthouse, but if you had another one now, it was treated as a first offense. Now, if you have a DUI, it follows you for the rest of your life in Massachusetts and every other state, and you can't rent a car in Canada, you can't rent a car in Mexico, so it's a lifelong sentence. Now, how do you equate that with getting buzzed at a party? Okay, so I, I wanted people to see the difference, the impact, the difference in impact uh, related to the time, the importance of time, just like the time value of money. You know, if you win the lottery, a million dollars, you go down to collect it, they're only gonna give you maybe 623,000 because of the time value of money. They say, well, if you want to get 50,000 a year for 20 years, we'll give it to you, it'd be a million. But if you want it now, 623,000 minus taxes. So, so that, like, like money, uh, uh, relationships, uh, occupational history, all those things have durability. They, they last a long time and you cannot just balance them as equals. Like uh, you tick the box for immediate gratification, you tick the box for long term, and don't worry about it. The second one was came to me in the middle of a of a meeting. It's been the most powerful tool we have now for getting people motivated to really and deciding to stop. Three of our board members now have told me that that was the tool that turned them. They were fooling around and rationalizing and so forth. And when they had to write it down and saw the interaction, the clear interaction uh, uh, of the HOV hierarchy of values, they suddenly, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, entertain anymore the fiction that, that the things that they said were valuable, their family, their job, their health, uh, the, the things they like to do for entertainment and everything, all negatively impacted by the addictive substance or behavior, which they almost never mentioned. They would write the list out of the things that were most important to them. And then I would say, well, what about alcohol? And they said, well, alcohol isn't a value. I said, well, how about access to alcohol? And they would see that every one of the things that they said were important to them were corrupted by or conflicted with the alcohol or the drug or the gambling or whatever it was. And, and there was sort of no way to escape, no way to wiggle out of it. Or well, we have an expression in America, weasel out of it. Um, so uh, those two things uh, fall into the most important category of motivational incentive. And, uh, you know, I guess you run a
a few thousand meetings, you, you learn something and you wake up to things. Incidentally, as I told uh, Jenny, I thought I had invented the term hierarchy of values, but I found out that, uh, that the Voltaire invented it in 1703. So he beat me by 300 years. <laughs> He's gonna remember that. Um, so your wife, Barbara, is Australian and she was a nurse who herself has done, what was it, a thousand meetings? Back, back well, I mean, when I got deeply involved with it, so she got very interested. She's a nurse and uh, always had a great capacity to understand people, explain to me all the problems with all my relatives that I had missed for, for 30 years. And uh, <laughs> I uh, very accurately, and, uh, and she said, I'm never going to see you if... Uh, if I don't get involved. So she got involved. She was a terrific facilitator and she, she stopped at a thousand meetings. So she said, okay, that's it for me. And that's I kept question. roaring on. But anyway, we made trips to Australia and on one of our trips, I decided that we would write a letter to some of the people where we actually, I called my relatives in Melbourne told them to open up the yellow pages. Anybody here? old enough to remember the yellow pages and, <laughs> and look and, and find some uh, addiction treatment programs. And I wrote them letters saying, we're going to be in town and we're, we're happy to give you a talk about smart recovery. So um, one of the groups, there were two groups responded from Melbourne. Um, one of them was Turning Point Clinic. And the uh, other group was from St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Alex Wodak was in charge of that. He was the professor. And we went there, we gave our talk. Uh, she, Barbara, gave a talk about women in recovery and smart recovery. And I talked a general talk about the smart recovery program. And they were interested. There was a nurse there named Bronwyn Crosby, who was his associate. And uh, nothing much happened for about two years. Then they started one meeting. And uh, then they got a grant, started a few more. But by full time four years went by, there were 50 meetings going on in New South Wales. The next time we went back, they said, well, the people from the New South Wales prisons want to talk to you. So we talked to them and they decided to introduce smart recovery into the New South Wales prison system. Uh, and they, they did a version of their own. They had a good cartoonist. One of the inmates was a cartoonist. He illustrated it, and they reduced the uh, reading level from eighth grade to sixth grade, but essentially it was the smart recovery program. Um, incidentally, I heard nothing about that. I think two years later, we came back. We gave a few talks to the treatment personnel. I ran a few meetings in the prisons, and that was the end of it. I didn't hear anything more about it. About five years later, I was on the uh, Australian board for... I think 12 years, which meant I had to get up at 2.30 in the morning all the time. So I finally dumped it <laughs> about a year ago. <laughs> and they're doing fine without me. But um, uh, I heard there was going to be a presentation by Chris Blatch on a study on 6,000 inmates in the New South Wales prison system. Well, this was astounding to me. How, how could they study 6,000 inmates? It turns out they'd studied 27,000 inmates in order to come up with the 6,000 to study. So uh, this was all under the radar. She presented the study. It was unbelievable. There was a 43% reduction in reconvictions for violent crimes within two years of release if people had had as few as 10 smart recovery meetings. And incidentally, the reductions ran up two meetings, there were even some reduction. Four meetings, more reduction. Six meetings, more reduction. Finally, it peaked at 10 and it didn't go down, it plateaued. So I think it means either you get smart recovery or you don't get smart recovery. It's not, it's not for everyone. I mean, doesn't, not everybody can, can get it, assimilate it. In the beginning, I remember the first meeting was in the basement of Memorial Hall at Harvard 
university. So people were saying, well, it's only for intellectuals. But uh, I knew that uh, I was running a prison group by that time. And uh, although, you know, it doesn't mean everybody in prison is, is stupid, but the educational level is low. And certainly it's not a place for great intellectual ferment. But inmates were getting it. Uh, they, they were improving. They were changing their locus of control from external to internal. And they were, some of them were excited about the program. And uh, so I knew that it was accessible to almost anyone. But not everybody understands it or not everybody wants to do a lot of thinking. Uh, some people uh, want, uh, you know, to be told what to do, uh, which is not, not our shtick, not our, uh, our modus operandi. So uh, that study was a tremendous uh, shock, I think, to not only to me, but to everyone. And uh, it was, it was a, a very special kind of study called the propensity matching study. So they, they searched a database of 21,000 inmates who had not been exposed to smart recovery to find 3,000 to match with the 3,000 inmates on 21 parameters uh, who had been exposed to smart recovery, some to as few as one or two meetings. Um, at any rate, uh, they, these 21 parameters are things like type of crime, type of addiction, number of previous convictions, ethnicity, sex, uh, uh, English as a first language, um, they give they give inmates a room and uh, they uh, when they do the intake and they do a very thorough assessment in the New South Wales prisons and they give them a likelihood of reoffending score from one to five so that's another one of the things that 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 were uh, that 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 were done in 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 establishing the control group the uh, uh, the reduction in crimes of any kind were 21 was 21 percent. Um, <clears throat> the study was published as the leading article in a what's called an invited article in the Journal of Forensic Practice, and that means the editor wrote an editorial about it. So it doesn't get any better than that <laughs> for a for a published study. Um, that the uh, program, uh, our, our corrections program is now in use in about 300 prisons worldwide. The latest uh, is the Canadian federal prison system, has it in all 54 prisons. Maybe I'll tell you a very brief story. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, the Inside Out program, which is what our corrections program is called, uh, uh, I sent a package to Swakopmund, Namibia because they could never afford to buy it. I had a request. And the uh, first meeting took place and the facilitator uh, wrote me back an email and said, uh, an inmate came up to me after the first meeting. He said, you know, having a heroin addiction is like being locked in a cage. But your program says you have the key. Well, that's pretty good insight into exactly what we do say. And uh, obviously made a profound impression on this inmate in the Swakopmund Namibia prison. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful. Um, and it reminds me of, uh, in the UK, I think smart recovery was actually um, adopted initially by a Scottish prison officer. He was the person who was advocating that this would be a great program. Yes, I got a call from uh, our office in Mentor, Ohio, that somebody wanted to talk to me from Inverness Prison. It turned out to be a man named Fraser Ross, who was a high school graduate and a veteran of the Royal Marines and had tattoos up and down both arms. And uh, Barbara and I went over. She's of Scottish extraction, so we we had we used that as an excuse to tour scotland <laughs> and uh went to the prison ran a few meetings 
did an all day training in Inverness City, which Frazier had set up. Frazier turned out to be an extremely thoughtful and talented facilitator and organizer. And the two years later, he asked us, asked us to come back, give talks in Glasgow and Edinburgh and the Corn Prison, which was the women's prison and so forth. So we used that excuse to go back again. And uh, uh, when we arrived in Inverness Prison, uh, Frazier said, the governor wants to see you. So we were ushered into the office of the governor. Man looked like in his late 50s. And he had us sit down and he leaned over the desk and looked me in the eye and said, Joe, I have never seen anything like this in my 20 years in the Scottish prison system. So that's what the impact of smart recovery was mm. in Inverness prison. It changed everything. It, it was so, so profound that the, he told me that the, the corrections officers came to him and said, we want smart recovery facilitator training. The recidivism rate dropped like a shot. The whole atmosphere of the prison changed. And uh, I was the keynote speaker the next year for the Scottish Prison System Conference. I was put up in the royal suite, which was nice. <laughs> I told my wife, don't get used to this. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, the, uh, all the Scottish prison systems uh, adopted the Inside Out program, all the Scottish prisons. And there are now almost 600 uh, meetings in the UK. It spread from the prisons to the, to the population of, of UK. Um, now, smart recovery is um, more compatible with the stages of change model, as you've mentioned earlier, than a lot of programs. It allows for the contemplation stage where people, you know, might not be ready to completely stop a behavior, but are con contemplating it. Um, but do you consider the program to be compatible with 12-step and other treatment options? Well, you know, whether I personally consider it compatible, I'd say philosophically and, um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, technique, no, because uh, our technique is motivational interviewing. The 12 step technique is didactic and authoritarian. Uh, we consider people, it's a self-empowerment program. 12 steps is a powerlessness program. However, you know, it's a little bit like they said, the uh, aeronautical engineers said the bee cannot fly. Its body's too big, its wings are too small, and it cannot fly. But the bee, ignorant of aeronautical engineering, flies. So it's the same thing. Now, um, we, we survey every year. Our full, uh, our full, not every single person fills out the survey, but we get between four and 600 uh, responses every year. And in Massachusetts, we've done a few surveys. And about 30% of people who come regularly to smart recovery meetings and consider it their primary recovery modality, also go at least occasionally to 12-step meetings. So if, it, if, it doesn't, if it's okay with them, fine with me. Uh, anything that helps them, if they come out of a meeting feeling better than they went in, fine, that's a plus. So we are completely agnostic on this. We say we're into choice. It's right in the front of our brochure, the power of choice. Um, there's a study going on now at Harvard Medical School by uh, John F. Kelly, who happens to be on the, uh, he's the professor of addiction medicine at Harvard, and uh, he happens to be on the uh, recovery, uh, the, uh, the uh, Smart Recovery Advisory Council, that's a, a, uh, a uh, committee of the, the board of Smart Recovery Australia. He's one of the members. I asked him to go on it, and he did. So he's one of the primary addiction uh, researchers in America. And he's got a study going sponsored by our National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, which is the top of the pyramid for alcohol studies. And uh, he's recruiting 400 subjects with alcohol use disorder who are beginning a new recovery attempt. So, so far there's about 120 subjects. Uh, about a quarter of them are using smart recovery. 
about a quarter are using AA, about a quarter are using both, and about a quarter are using neither. They're, they're going to private practitioners or intensive outpatient programs, and they don't want to go to a mutual recovery group. So uh, that's it on the ground. The facts on the ground are uh, de jure, the programs are not compatible. De facto, they are. And people, people use both, and that's fine with us. Now, at the, at the extremes, there are people who say, uh, you can't get over alcoholism without AA. And on the other side are the people who totally reject the 12-step approach. Uh, and that's it. And then in the middle of the people who can go either way. And, and uh, I sometimes get visitors come to my meetings. About, about three months ago, when we still had face-to-face -face meetings, two men showed up to my meeting. Uh, one turned out uh, to be about uh, 45, had been in, in uh, AA for 12 years. The other was 52, I think, had been in AA for 25 years. And during the check-in, they revealed this. And I said, well, why did you come to the Smart Recovery Meeting? They said, well, uh, we never accepted the concept of powerlessness. And we want to see what Smart Recovery was all about. So despite the fact that they never accepted the concept of powerlessness, they stuck with it for 12 or 25 years and, and became sober, never had a relapse and so forth. So, uh, you know, that, is that good or bad? Well, it's, it's good, I think. Other people uh, have been in AA maybe 10 years, one man 25 years. As soon as they heard about smart recovery, they quit AA, got facilitated training, started a smart recovery meeting. So, uh, that's it. It's a mixed bag, and people are like that. Um, there's, there's this segmentation of people's approach, what, what the Germans called Weltanschauung, or world outlook, or view, world view. Um, the, this dichotomy, Platonic and Aristotelian, has been known for well, over 2,000 years, the times of Plato and Aristotle. So the Platonic approach is spiritual, idealistic, and so forth. And the uh, Aristotelian is empiric, objective, just the facts. And uh, there are people in both categories, but there's people in the middle who doesn't make too much difference to them one way or the other. Mm. Yeah, I remember personally going to Outpatient, going to SMART, going to AA with the attitude of, I'm just going to do as much as I possibly can and try everything. And it all worked. Um, but I remember you saying to me uh, when you came to Australia, um, nobody here seemed to think it wasn't spiritual enough, a program. No, that was the amazing <laughs> thing to me. Uh, and, and delightful that wherever we went and gave talks, people said, well, yeah, really, that sounds good. And uh, nobody ever said, well, the program is, what do you do? Uh, smart recovery isn't spiritual, or what about spirituality? You know, people say to me that still I, at, at conferences, I say, listen, some of the most spiritual moments I have ever experienced have been in smart recovery meetings. You know, mm. uh, people have told me uh, smart recovery saved my life. Is that a spiritual moment or not? I gave the keynote at the London, first London conference on smart recovery. And uh, uh, I was introduced again, mistakenly, as the founder of smart recovery. But I, I decided not to make a big fuss about it. I was the founding president. But um, so after the end of the conference, there were 250 people there. It was sold out. It was really the beginning of the big push with smart recovery in the UK. And we rapidly ran up the line to 500 or 600 meetings. But um, uh, as we were leaving, I was uh, putting on my jacket and a young man came up to me and stuck his hand out. And so I shook his hand and he looked me in the eye and he said, you saved my life. Now, I didn't say, I knew what he meant. He meant I started Smart Recovery and it was there for him 
when nothing else worked and so forth. So if that's not a spiritual moment, I don't know which. I had shivers up and down my spine. Uh, these are dramatic moments. Um, things like that happen at spot recovery meetings. People finally get it. Or they, they love my HOV program. They say, wow, this is terrific. Well, that's, is that a spiritual moment or not? You know? So um, there's plenty of spirituality. Depends how you define it. The U.S. courts have been very, very clear. Seven circuit courts of appeal. These, this is the next level to the Supreme U.S. Supreme Court. Next level down. Circuit, circuit courts of appeal. Seven. Three state Supreme Courts. All have said the same thing. Twelve-step programs, at least as, as they go in the U.S., are pervasively religious. And because of our Constitution, no one can be coerced to go to that kind of a meeting by any state organ. So, uh, but that's limited to, uh, when I say no one, no atheist or agnostic can be forced. In other words, no non-religious person can be forced into an, a, a program that is indoctrinating religion. That's, that is the nature of the U.S. Constitution. It's uh, similar in Canada and, and now been established, not at the high court, but at a district court in Canada. So people who object to coercion, uh, coerce, coerced attendance at 12-step meetings in the U.S. Uh, don't have to go. Now, uh, if they're under court orders and so forth, it's very difficult. It takes a very strong person, whatever your ideals and your ideology, to, to go against the authorities when you're vulnerable to being sent to prison and so forth. But the law is clear. The last decision said, this is unusually well settled law. 10 positive decisions, no negative decisions. It'll ne never go to our Supreme Court because they only like to take cases where there's dispute among the circuit courts. But of course the, the Australian constitution is different. I don't know what the practices are. Yeah, in um, I just noticed someone in the, uh, the chat room actually saying we had a priest in one of our groups and he stayed for a couple of years until he got transferred to Rome. So that's nice. Um, yes, uh, I, I think I mentioned to, uh, to uh, uh, Jenny that, uh, that it was a priest who kind of pushed me into doing uh, smart recovery. A Dominican priest who was a patient of mine. And uh, I took care of his father and his mother. He was a wonderful man, a real saint. And uh, when I was, uh, you know, uh, debating whether to get myself deeply involved, I, I was working very hard, long hours, weekends, everything. And, you know, was very reluctant to get into it. And he, he pushed me into it. So I, I owe my, my devotion to smart recovery, my involvement of it really to a, to a priest. And right now I'm working with a, a brother, a Jesuit brother in, um, in Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, uh, North Dakota, uh, Indian Reservation. We're introducing our Inside Out program into the Oglala Lakota prison uh, or jail. Uh, he's going to be running the program there. So uh, this among rational and, and uh, uh, reasonable people, there's a lot of room for interaction. Um, I think in our last 10 or so minutes, I, I'll just bring us up to date and, and talk about uh, how smart recovery has risen to the challenge of the pandemic. Uh, so at last count, um, about 537 meetings have moved online. Um, so people can just have a Zoom meeting. Yeah, well, yeah. well I, I don't know if we'll ever be the same, if things will ever be the same. But uh, fortunately for us, very fortunately, we were having a lot of troubles with the, we had about 27, 30 online meetings of Smart Recovery. And uh, back about, just about a year and a half ago, and we were having a lot of trouble with the platform. It, it, it was awkward and there was no video and so forth. So uh, we had in our board a, a woman named Michelle Elkins. She was retired from a, a big international 
uh, company, what we call a S&P 400 company. She was the IT person, uh, executive. And so she took on the job of changing our platform to Zoom. It was a big job, uh, much bigger than she anticipated, I think. But we did manage to change over those meetings, those 27 meetings, into the Zoom platform. Now, that's before anybody ever heard of Zoom. <laughs> now, uh, one day I got a call from the the uh, Professor Roger Weiss, who's the head of addictions at McLean Hospital, Harvard's major teaching hospital. And he said, well, Joe, I hate to tell you this, but the six meetings that Smart Recovery is running each week at McLean, we have to close them down because we're shutting off all visitors to the uh, hospital. So I took a big gulp and started running around like a lunatic trying to figure out how to get people on, get their meetings transferred onto Zoom. But fortunately, we already had the platform and we, we had facilitators who were familiar with the technical issues and so forth. And uh, so uh, Mark Ruth, our current uh, uh, executive director, mobilized everybody, assigned two people to, to give out Zoom licenses. They had to go through the, uh, through the list, uh, a meeting list of uh, 2,300 meetings that we have in the U.S. and uh, put, put an on hiatus label on about 1,800 of them and then start handing out these Zoom licenses. And Mark was able to dredge up a couple of grants uh, quickly, uh, emergency grants which allowed us to buy these Zoom licenses a hundred at a time on a wholesale basis. And uh, as Jenny said, we ended up with 537, plus we expanded the number of national online meetings. That's 537 local meetings. The national meetings we've expanded to 60, but they're still greatly overcrowded. There's two to 300 people can show up at these meetings. But anyway, we, we didn't go down in flames. We didn't go bankrupt. That's the good news. Now we're going to have to figure out where we go from here, but I, I think we'll endure. I think it's now, as you know, may know, the, uh, the uh, Smart Recovery Australia got a $400,000 grant from the federal government of Australia to move its meetings onto Zoom. I presume everybody's heard about that. Yeah, and there, so there's a, around 70 meetings have moved online now, which is just incredible. So, I mean, yeah. much every day of the week, you'd be able to well, go to our website, find an online meeting whenever you get an urge. Right. So, so things have developed, though, because we've consolidated all the online meetings, Australian, UK, and US, which makes sense because you know, three o'clock in the morning, if you can't sleep, you want to go to a meeting, you can, you can go to a meeting now. So there's no reason why they shouldn't be consolidated. They're all in English, not all. We now have a Spanish meeting and we're trying to add more. Um, um, in, incidentally, you may not know this, but um, our handbook, third edition handbook is translated, is published in 15 languages. And we are now ac actively working on Haitian Creole, Russian, Japanese, and uh, one more. Japanese, Russian. Well, I can't even think of it, but, oh yeah, Punjabi. We're, trans we're translating our prison program into Punjabi. Yeah, Hebrew recently, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Talking of books, um, Mark Ruth, who, as you mentioned, is the executive director, has mentioned in the uh, chat group that Joe and some of the others from the early days should write a smart book. Any thoughts on that? Well, I've got, uh, I, I have thoughts of writing three different articles. I'm writing one now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think Mark will tell you I've taken on a, a huge potential responsibility in a million dollar grant that we applied for, for a rural county in America. So I'm, 
my time is well accounted for if we get the grant. If we don't get the grant, well, maybe we will write something up. Uh, as I say, Bill White, who very early on recognized the importance of spot recovery and gave us a lot of support. So he did an extensive interview of me, of Tom Horvath. Tom was president, I think, for 14 years. Um, and uh, after I burned out after one year, <laughs> that was a very rough year. Uh, and um, uh, another interview of, uh, of uh, 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 Phillips, who was a, uh, a, a, uh, the executive director of the UK Smart Recovery, uh, all uh, did extensive interviews. So he's got that all down. He's written already two books about, uh, about the uh, recovery system in America. And uh, I think if he writes a third one, he'll include a lot in smart recovery. Um, so uh, it's on my list, but it's well down right now. Well, okay, well, I've got a few questions and comments in the last five minutes. Um, uh, Anna says, as a facilitator, the online platform has been great. Not only am I able to keep meetings available for our participants, but it's been a great way to keep myself occupied and, and engaged. Um, and I've got a couple of questions as well. Yeah, let me just comment on that because people have different responses. Some people think this is fantastic. They love the online meetings. They love the fact they don't have to travel to the meeting. And uh, so for them, it's been a big boon. They, they can eat dinner while, they, while they're at the meeting or whatever. Other people miss terribly the personal face-to-face -face contact. And they've gone to extremes to, to still have a face-to-face -face meeting, like parking their cars in a big lot, in a big circle, and sitting on the hoods of the car six feet apart so they can have the meeting and see each other in person. So it's been a, a fascinating experience, the divergence of attitude about this. The other interesting thing is that I was terribly disappointed when, uh, when I asked Michelle Elkins when we started the Zoom meetings. I thought it'd be wonderful for everybody to show their picture and be able to see each other, see the body language. And I found out only 25% of people were turning on their cameras. The others were just using the audio. And so we, we, you know, worked this thought about it. Why would that be? Why could it be? And so forth. But when the local meetings went online, 90% of the people turn on their cameras. So there's something about the, you know, saying, well, this is, this is the Miami meeting. This is the uh, Fitzroy meeting or whatever that gets people to feel this is, this is personal. I don't think it's an anonymity issue because you're much more an anonymous on a national meeting, you know, where there's a hundred people <laughs> from a, a, a country with 330 million people than you are necessarily in a, in a local area, even though everybody is sincerely involved in anonymity, there's a, at least a statistical chance you'll see somebody you know. So, so that, that local issue is still a, a crucial issue for people. They, they want to know that the group has got some kind of bonding related to what team they're rooting for and where they live and so forth. We did have a comment. Um, it was because smart meetings were offered online via Zoom uh, as a result of COVID that I felt safe seeking support. I would never have walked into a face-to-face -face meeting. I think it keeps a lot of people stuck. So having the flexibility and option of online, particularly for those in remote and isolated areas, is so important. I'm just going to move on to some questions because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, there's two I'm going to push together. Um, Patrick asks, what is your greatest wish for the future of SMART? And Suzanne asks, where do you see SMART evolving in the future? Whoa, <laughs> that's a big one. Well, we just had a, uh, a strategic planning meeting, the board and, and other maybe another 10 or 12 people who have been great workers for smart recovery, propelling it, great thinkers about strategy and so forth. So we are all a big group and the substance abuse and mental health services uh, administration of the United States government, a very important agency that handles about $4 billion 
that gave us the services, donated us the services, 36 hours of a, a very competent uh, consultants, uh, business and, and uh, nonprofit consultants, for which we're grateful. So we planned out a strategy for five years, but thinking ahead many, many years, um, uh, uh, we, uh, we would, I think we will continue to use something like Zoom for a variety of reasons, especially in rural areas, in uh, places where travel is difficult, babysitting and so forth. Women, I think, feel safer and uh, since they're usually the primary, the primary care givers often for children have more difficulty in getting to meetings and so forth. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the number of uh, women who, who uh, responded to a request to be on a study comparing SMART recovery and, uh, and AA uh, we, who were, who were uh, uh, requested, the participation was requested through an online meeting of AA people um, called uh, In the Rooms. And so there was 60% of those respondees were women. That's way above the usual percentage in an AA meeting. So uh, some, well, for whatever reasons, women seem more comfortable and more attuned. Uh, and generally speaking, the number of, the percentage of women in our online meetings, national online meetings, is greater than our local meetings also. Now, now uh, the women are less likely to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, not much less, but significantly less. So 60% is a overrepresentation. So, uh, so, but for many reasons, as many people would rather do it online. So I think we'll be persisting with local online meetings, but uh, many people, as I mentioned, want to, they, they want to be there in the room with other people. And uh, we will be, we, we've already had 20 meetings reconstitute. As soon as the facility or the venue opened up, now they told me from the central office, 20 groups want to reconstitute. They have to follow state guidelines. Often they can't have more than 10 people, et cetera, et cetera. But they found places, uh, you know, picnic areas under a canopy, things like that, where they can meet where the weather is decent. Uh, and so uh, there's going to be maybe a bifurcation here into local meetings and national and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, online meetings, face-to-face -face and online. Now, in terms of the international, uh, clearly that's a, a tremendous potential, uh, but it's expensive because, you know, in Australia and the U.S. and the U.K., we have access to funds and donations and things like that, but, you know, I don't think it's going to happen in Russia or Uzbekistan or uh, maybe even Japan. Um, so uh, that is, uh, we'll have to see how we're going to finance that. Hopefully we'll be able to get contributions from some international body or other. Uh, right now, Tony Wales has done the most of the financing it, but that's not going to go on forever. So, so this is a predicament in terms of our spread. The demand is there. The cultural um, Cultural uh, uh, spread is there. We, we have a Farsi edition. We have an Arabic edition. The Israeli government has just funded a Hebrew. That's the last language, Hebrew. I forgot it. The Israeli government just gave a grant to translate our handbook into Hebrew. So uh, uh, pretty soon we'll... Uh, we had our conference in uh, Chicago. Uh, I purchased flags for 20, at that time, 25 countries. But the day the conference was to open, uh, the staff called me and said, hey, we just added Brunei. So I had a FedEx uh, Brunei flag up there. There were 27 flags. Now we're up to, I think, 29. So uh, that's the future in the international and in the national. And Australia's going to have to figure out what its own future is. 
I've got two more really quick ones, um, and then I think we, we'd better close the webinar. But um, uh, Suzanne asks, will SMART always center around CBT, or will it embrace other modalities such as um, ACT, ACT, inclusive of a mindful component? Yes. So, I mean, there is, if we want to remain, certainly there have been new developments in the CBT areas, usually different aspects or different styles or additional, uh, additional uh, components of CBT. They all fall into what we call the cognitive sciences. But there's a limit to what we can expect lay people to do uh, in terms of training and uh, the breadth of what they have to know and, and learn. So uh, uh, yes, professionals can pick up those types of techniques. And, uh, uh, but I, I'm just concerned that, you know, right now we have a program, training program probably takes professionals about 20 hours, but a lay person without much familiarity about these things, probably 25, 28 hours. So there's a, a limitation of how much we can load on them. Right now, our program works. It seems to work well. Uh, and it doesn't work for everybody and it's not perfect. But personally, I'm just concerned about expanding the, the breadth of our you know, therapeutic techniques further than they are now. Now, one other thing, we, we, we've been trying to add a meditative element to our program for about five or six years. Just haven't been able to do it, haven't been able to get the traction. We, we now have a, a meditation session online um, every Sunday evening, I, no, every Wednesday evening at eight o'clock Eastern time in the US, uh, which is, seems to be very successful. And uh, maybe we'll go in that direction. But how much we want to have facilitators get involved with that, I'm not sure. I think the best technique is probably to have it online so that people can access it whenever they want in their own home, uh, rather than doing it at meetings. Although that's what I've been doing for many years on occasion. So yeah. that's where I see things going, yeah. I'll try that myself. Um, last one, uh, Alexander says, uh, can you explain your view on why you are not the founder? We did touch on earlier the fact that Smart Audio. Yes, uh, well, I, I was one of, I, when I joined up, I started the 13th meeting. So that was the 13th meeting in the United States in the basement of Memorial Hall at Harvard. So there were already 12 meetings running almost all by mental health professionals in different cities. So by definition, I was not the founder. Uh, the founder was really Jack Trimpey, who invented the concept, who invented rational recovery. And it was very bright, very articulate, but very autocratic individual. And that just didn't lend with a nonprofit uh, style or organization. So eventually we split. When, when, uh, when we split, uh, we, we formed a corporation, a nonprofit corporation, like you have in Australia. And so I was elected president. So I was the founding president. We named it Smart Recovery. I happened to think up the name. Subsequently, we realized it was an acronym, Self-Management Addiction Recovery Training or AND Recovery Training. So that's it. But I was only the president for one year. I was burned out. I was running a busy practice teaching and, and all the turmoil of the development of a completely new uh, organization. Tom Horvath took over and was president for mostly uh, one term, someone else was president for about, I don't know, 15, 18 years. I then had another term, two-year term as president. So uh, I've been deeply involved in the organization, but I was not the founder. Perfect. All right, that clarifies that. Thank you. 
Joe, thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. I don't think you can see them, but the comments in the chat box have been um, very appreciative. Lots of fans. Uh, so hopefully you can take the time to have a look at that afterwards. Um, but yes, it's, it's been thorough. It's been very entertaining. And it's, it's your third meeting of the evening as well, having already got okay. Miami facilitated Miami meeting, you've had a board meeting, and now you've had an hour long webinar. So thank you so much. I must say, just to close it, you know, we're just talking here like we're in the, we're in the same room. Uh, when I first got involved in Australia, namely with my wife, who I, I met in the Bronx here, and then I called Australia to, to ask her to come back to America. Uh, it was, uh, I had to do it through an operator. It was $25 for three minutes, and it took about five minutes to set the call up. Now compare that with what this is. You just hit the button on your computer, and a thing, couple things spin around. The next thing you know, we're, talk, we're looking and talking to each other. Yeah. So the world has certainly changed in that, in that period. Yeah, maybe maybe in a few years' time we'll be doing hologram meetings. Who knows? <laughs> okay, bye bye. Thank you all for your Thank attention. You. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>